This uh, video is about the online course design standards at Rush University. I will go through the Rush University standards for course design uh, quickly. I don't want to spend a bunch of time going through every little thing. And then I'm going to give you an option to help you design a course that uh, will, will meet these standards um, as much as possible by using a template, okay? So the first part is the institution's approved course syllabus template is used. I do believe that by the fall of 2018, that approved course syllabus template will be available. And there are a lot of sections on there that meet these uh, guidelines in section two, which is expectations provided for the following. What's really important about teaching online classes and designing online classes is that this part here, faculty response time is included in the syllabus so students know when to expect an answer to their question or when to expect a grade or feedback on their assignments. Next is etiquette, netiquette and code of conduct. Uh, it's sad, but students need to know what's appropriate and, and not appropriate, especially given the ubiquity of uh, social media and the way that people tend to behave um, kind of atrociously sometimes on social media with that will not be allowed in online classes and students need to know how to be respectful of each other. And then the third is asynchronous participation requirements and guidelines. In order to have your course comply with standards, it needs to have regular interaction with the students and the instructor. So having opportunities for students to regularly interact with each other and regularly means regularly. That, that does not mean uh, five out of 15 weeks you have them do a discussion. This means you have them doing some type of interaction on a weekly basis with the exception of weeks that they are taking exams or, or perhaps weeks that they're turning in a major assignment. Number three is an introduction that tells the students uh, where to get started and how the course is going to work and how to find course components. One way of doing that is, is through a video, but you need to make sure if you do that, that the video has uh, closed captioning. So you'll have to put it on YouTube so that you have closed captions or use uh, Panopto and that will also have course captioning. So one way of doing number three, I'm going to show you a course template that the staff at CTEI created. And in that, if you go into course content, we have a start here module. And this is where you can put a class overview, um, tips for discussion, what to do first, things like that. Okay, so uh, I'll show you more about this template as we go on in, in the standards. Number four is and basically a calendar with due dates and times for activities. So the students will be able to have a really quick view of what is due and when it is due, so there's no guesswork. So students do still like to print things, and that will be really handy. When I teach online classes, I usually provide that in the Start Here area and I leave it there the entire semester so students can refer to it. Number five is consistent due dates and times. What that means is pick days of the week that you want your assignments to be due. It's very typical in the online arena to have assignments due Sunday night at 11.59 p.m., which gives the students the entire weekend to get their work done. And then the faculty member has that whole next week to be able to grade. And um, so let's say you have regular discussions and assignments each week. Pick two, di two different days, and, and that's when everything's almost always due. In my classes, it's Thursdays and Sundays. So I have discussions due on Thursday, their, their initial response due on Thursday, and then peer responses and all assignments due on Sunday. This is for consistency, so students <clears throat> aren't wondering all the time, what, what day of the week are things due? 
We do have an, improve, an approved master course template which is provided to you in Blackboard each time you have a course created. But if you want to, you can request the online and blended course template that I just showed you. I'll go back to that. In the template, you have um, 15 weeks, and your class might be 14 weeks, so you can just delete one. 14 weeks of folders, and within each folder, you have the same content. You have a, a, a week with a number, uh, and then you have an agenda, and the agenda is downloadable. It's in doc format, so you can edit it however you want. It has a space for an introduction to the week, objectives, what the students have to read or what they need to listen to, what they are going to discuss. So I put discussion questions here so that they know what their discussion questions are going to be and a description of their assignments. That's provided to you every single week. And then you can uh, add the assignments to each week. Okay, so here's a, here's a week two discussion that you can edit and then if you need to, you can um, add assignments that are due and things like that. So each week is, is very similar and it cuts down on design time. If you want to use this template, send an email to ctei at rush.edu and one of us will give you access to that template as well as information about how to use it by putting it into your own course. Okay, so number seven would be obviously taken care of too, is that uh, it's, the content is organized, it's very logical, it's clearly labeled. Something that students complain about a lot is that one course is units and then the units are sometimes two weeks long, sometimes three weeks long, sometimes one week long, and that there's so much guesswork. And that's, that's a lot of cognitive load on a student when he or she is trying to learn content uh, taking brain time to figure out where content is, is not something that we want to do for our students. So uh, make sure and logically organize your content. This is number eight is a, a major requirement for quality matters and almost, well, every other quality um, rubric that you can find out there is having measurable and observable learning objectives that align with course level outcomes. This is not an easy thing to do. Okay, writing measurable and observable learning objectives is an art. And if you have never been taught how to, definitely reach out to one of the instructional designers and uh, our, our center will definitely help you. It's super, super hard. And we'll also have a workshop on that. If the workshop has already passed by the time you viewed this, there will be a recording available. So reach out to us if you don't know how to find those recordings. Number nine, it's important for the students to know who you are, especially if you teach online, which you wouldn't be watching this if you didn't teach online, right? So having uh, your information provided to them before the class starts or at least in the first week is definitely important to establish a rapport early on with your students. And number 10 is another way of establishing that, that community with your students and having them get to know each other. Now, if you have a cohort, obviously they all know each other, so that's not that important. In terms of activities and interaction, you should have a Q&A, um, I always call it a virtual office, discussion forum available. So if we go to the course template here, we've got that already created for you. This allows students to ask you questions that are re related to the course, that way you're not answering 35 emails about the same exact thing. And I know you know what I'm talking about because it happens all the time. And as the instructor, you can subscribe right here to this and so you will get an email when a student posts a question. So in case you're not in the classroom, you can get an email um, so that you can come in the classroom and respond to the student's question in a timely manner. Virtual office hours, you can do virtual office hours in a, in a myriad of ways, but make sure that you are available to your students during the week in case they need to have some one-on-one -on -one time with you. You can do it through virtual meetings, 
There's many different ways. If you don't know how to do virtual office hours or you need some tools, reach out to the center and we can give you some suggestions. Number 13 goes back to that interaction piece that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. It's very, very important to have regular and substantive interaction for your students and important for you to be part of that interaction, for you to have presence in your class. And the, the, you can do this all kinds of ways. You can use wikis, you can use blogs, you can use discussions, you can use online tools to have students record video. Uh, there's just a bunch of different ways to do that. But having that is essential for a quality online experience and also a requirement for the federal government for online classes. Now, you may have a complete, completely quantitative course and you're wondering, Angela, how am I going to do that in a quantitative class? We do formulas and numbers and things like that. There are ways. Trust me. So reach out to CTEI at rush.edu and we can give you some suggestions on how to do that. So the student interaction needs to account for a course grade so that they are motivated to do that. When you create discussion forums, your questions or your prompts for discussion should foster reflection, critical thinking, and promote discourse. What this really means is you're not asking students a question that has a yes or no, right or wrong answer, okay? That is also an art form. So if you've never been taught how to write effective discussion questions online, you need to come and see us because we know how to help you. Even if we don't know your subject, we will be able to help you write really good questions that will get your students talking and interacting seven days of the week, seriously. So for number 16, if you teach online but you require some synchronous sessions, please make sure you indicate that uh, before the students sign up for class, just in case they have a full-time job or other full-time responsibilities and they have to be able to plan in advance. The learning activities in your course. Try really hard to offer different types of learning activities. While it's easy to just have students write papers and submit papers, Eh, it, it kind of leaves a lot to be desired for the student. And if you just have students reading and listening and then taking quizzes, that's also kind of eh. There are a lot of things that you can do, a lot of activities that take students to the next level in terms of their thinking and problem solving. Uh, so if you need some help with that, we can help you. Try to use a variety of content methods, such as uh, images, okay, some videos, and some interactive content. Now, interactive content is not easy. That's kind of like super tech-savvy tech for tech-savvy people, but there are some easy ways. You can actually create interactive PowerPoints. I don't know if you knew that, but you can. And I even have a template that you can use so that you don't have to figure out how to make that work if students click on one thing and, and it says, oh yes, you are right. They click on another thing, oh, that's too bad, try again. If you would like to have a PowerPoint template, you can reach out to us and I can give that to you. Make sure that what the students are learning actually is related to the objectives. I, you would not believe this, but I've been in this field for quite some time now, and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly in terms of online course design and content. I think one of the, the worst things that, set, that appears in my mind when I think about this is, is a professor who was teaching in education, of all things education, and what the person had the students doing had absolutely no relation whatsoever with the written objectives for that week. Like there was, it couldn't even like even remotely be connected. So yeah, you don't want to do that. So when you're deciding what you're going to do each week of your class, look at your learning objectives and say, okay, how does this relate? And if I, if you meet one of the learning objectives, then you don't need another activity for it. So it's like cross that out right? If you need help with that kind of alignment, uh, an instructional designer would be really, really good to reach out to and help you. 
Try to keep your learning materials up to date using textbooks that are really, really old. Uh, maybe nice for you know vintage memories and things like that, but try to keep everything as up to date as possible. Sometimes just using uh, learning materials that you can find online, like articles and videos, are useful versus a you know two hundred dollar textbook that gets outdated really fast. Uh, try not to uh, break the law <laughs> when you're doing online teaching. If you can, use Creative Commons licensed things as much as possible. There are a lot of things that fall under fair use guidelines for education, uh, but, but work on that. This is more so for ADA, even though we cover, cover ADA a little bit further down. Um, when you write things for your students, and I'll, that's um, down here somewhere, where I'm talking about faculty creating content. When, if you do create content yourself, uh, make it easy to read. You don't wanna have like a huge block of text, right? Nobody likes that. Even when I read academic articles, if it's like a huge block of text, I'm not motivated to read it. Break it up a little bit. Uh, try to avoid animated text or GIF files. I don't mean animations such as how the heart beats, Right? Like if that's in your class, that's fine. I'm talking about like a clown that's riding a unicycle and juggling three balls in the air. Right? That's like not necessary. Right? Don't want to do stuff like that. Okay? If you are concerned, okay, about your content or you're not sure, like maybe you, you struggle with grammar and punctuation and you know that, you're super smart, but not the best writer, you might wanna reach out to an instructional designer to have somebody just kind of proofread your content for you. So that's what I was talking about. Number 24, when you teach online, people who are not trained to do so assume that it's perfectly okay to assign a chapter, to have the students discuss something, have the students take a quiz, and then the next week, you know, turn in an assignment. That's kind of a myth, okay? Students like to hear from their faculty member who's teaching them. So please develop some content for your students as much as possible, whether it is just text where you're writing the students a couple of pages of your experience, or your viewpoint about what they were supposed to read that week or whatever, or you create a video for the students. They really like that and try to do that as much as possible. And our center can help you create that content. Also, I know I keep saying that, it's like I'm selling us, but, but the reality is, is that's what we are here for. And I don't think a lot of faculty know that. So we want them to be active with their learning, not just reading, right? So what can you do to get the students active and participating in their learning? So if you don't know, you can Google that, <laughs> active learning techniques, or you can come and see us and we can give you some ideas. If possible, have all of your content loaded into Blackboard uh, or whatever learning management system um, happens to be the current one. Um, before the class starts, okay? I know that that's not the easiest thing to do, but if you are busy creating content while you're supposed to be teaching your online class, your students will suffer. So if at all possible, get it all loaded in advance and then you can release it as needed to the students, okay? Number 27 is something new to most people and that is providing students with content that is a little bit lower than where you want them to be and a little bit higher or even higher than they should be at that particular time. This is more like personalized or adaptive learning and doing it in a really low tech way. So if you already have a course that's designed and you have some time on your hands, think about creating a folder specifically for students who struggle or who need some remediation, okay? If you notice like students doing not doing poorly on their quizzes on um, formative assessments, which you should have, I talk about that in a couple minutes, um, 
if they're doing poorly on their formative assessments, you can put tell the student, hey, I want you to go to this folder and look at some of these activities to help you get um, to remediate a little bit. I wouldn't use the word remediate, but you know what I mean. And then there might be students for whom your content is just like old hat, right? You know these students, they're like, they could teach the class. So if you can make a folder of more advanced information or activities, things like that, to like, to, so that student isn't bored, uh, just put that in your course somewhere. And, and it, it's not for everybody. Just tell the students um, who you want to access that um, to be able to personalize it a little bit more. You want to make sure that the assessments that you create measure your course's learning objectives. You'd be surprised at how many times a student will say, why did I take a test on uh, the renal system when we learned about the, I don't even know, I don't, I'm not a medical person. So, you know, they learned about metabolism, okay? And they have questions on their test about the renal system. I'm sure that they're related in some medical way, and you're probably laughing at me if you know that they are related in some way, but tr it, the, this happens sometimes when you use um, question banks that you didn't write. So just be careful that your assessments are really measuring what you told the students they were going to be learning, okay? So that there's not a big shock and that there's alignment, okay? If you can, provide the students with a variety assess of assessments. Nobody wants to have a class that has four big exams and their entire grade is based on those four exams. Yeah, that's like high stress, high stakes uh, craziness. Instead of doing that, you can provide some small formative assessments. Maybe the students take a bunch of small quizzes for understanding and you drop the lowest four grades or something like that. Maybe you have papers, maybe you have projects. I'm really big on projects. Those types of things to assess the students in your course. And of course, discussions are also a form of assessment. So number 30 talks about the use of frequent formative assessments. These could be just simple three questioned little quizzes that count for very little. So they're low stakes, but they're help, they help you as a professor know what the students are getting and not getting. When you have assignments, okay, that are like papers or projects, you need to provide your students with grading criteria or grading rubrics, as well as clear directions, a place to submit them. They should not be submitting anything on email. Okay, that's like 1998 way of doing things. And I mean, no offense by that, but the learning management system provides you a way of, of having students securely uh, submit their assignments to you and provides you a fantastically easy way of grading them within the learning management system. The students should know when to expect feedback from you on their assignments. What I typically do is tell students that they'll receive a grade and feedback within seven days of the assignment being due. So. If my assignments are due on Sunday, which they always are, they can expect to receive their grade and the feedback the following Sunday. Whatever you do, just make sure your students know and that you stick to it. So your course should be offered in the learning management system, okay? That the tools that you use support, they make sense, okay? With what you're trying to have the students learn, when you have videos, it's easy to actually embed videos in your course. And I don't mean by downloading an MP4 and uploading it into Blackboard. I mean using the Blackboard tool um, called Mashups that allow you to embed YouTube videos versus just giving students a link and having them click on it and go out to YouTube where they see like dancing monkeys and cats that play the piano and things like that. We don't want them to be distracted by that, okay? Make sure in, their, in your syllabus that students know which technologies are required of your class and which are not. And links should be available so that they can check that out. The accessibility section is probably the most challenging for everyone and including myself because I don't know a lot about, about accessibility, but these standards will help you get there. Now, if you're not there yet, that's okay. This is a process these standards are new so give yourself a break and a go at it as, as little as possible at a time 
to make it reasonable. So if you have, for example, videos that are required of your students that do not have closed captions, you should not make them, or you sh actually should not make them, yeah, uh, required. And if you do have a requirement, be, be sure to offer some type of alternative. If you have students playing online games, uh, you have to make sure that those games are accessible to students, if not, provide an alternative. So PDF should be used whenever possible. It's the best for screen readers. Your audio video content should have closed captioning or a transcript document. If you plan to make instructor videos and not use Panopto or YouTube for the videos, you can always write your, your script first, um, the, what you're generally going to say, and upload that as a PDF as under your video. Images that are non-superfluous should have alt text included in them. When you're in Blackboard, if you right-click on your image, let me go to this, this class here and see if I can show you um, quickly what I mean. So if I go here to edit, uh, and you see there's my image right here. If I right-click on that, I can go to image. and under advanced, okay, I can do an alternative image or I can actually do a mouse over here where I say the number one, okay? So if a mouse goes over that and a student can't see, okay, then perhaps their screen reader will say the number one. It, it is kind of a superfluous image, okay? Um, but I wanted to show you also here, if you do this, I forgot to show you this. Um, if you go to image, here's the image description here on the first one. But if you go to the advanced button, you can do the mouse over. Oh, it didn't stay. All right, it's not being, it's not being kind to me right now, so we will just forget that and go back to the standards. Okay. So um, content is cognitively easy to comprehend. You try to make things as simple as possible. When you create text in Word, please use headers, titles, and styles. Not a lot of people know how to use styles. If you don't, please Google it. It's fairly easy to do once you're aware of how to do it, okay? Uh, use color sparingly. That's very, very hard for somebody like me who's a super creative person. It's because people do have um, a color blindness. My husband is one of them. And uh, you don't want to make it cognitively difficult for people to understand what you're doing. A uh, sans serif font. Um, Arial is an example of a sans serif font. Um, you can Google others. Okay, try to use at least 12 point. When web links are used, um, include a um, description of the link and why, it is, why it's being accessed. So don't say click here and do not just post a link. Let me give you an example. So this is an unpublished website, but I'm going to use it as an example. So I'm gonna copy that link and this is the wrong thing to do. Okay, that's the wrong thing to do in Blackboard, okay? Instead, you can say, so I will highlight the link, and in Blackboard, I would click the link button, but here I'm doing it a different way because I'm in Word. And so what you do is highlight text and then link it. So why don't I show you this in Blackboard because I'm just thinking, Angela, you're not being a very good teacher right now because you're showing things in Blackboard or in Word that you really want them to learn in Blackboard. So let me give you an example. So this is in Blackboard. I will highlight part of the sentence here, this button right here is the link button, click that, paste the link, 
and then under target choose open in a new window that way it doesn't um, take them out of the class okay that's how you do it that's the correct way of working with links for accessibility purposes okay all right so under evaluation the last couple of things is the course allows for student feedback at least once during the course. What you can do in Blackboard, you can actually create a survey that's anonymous. I highly suggest you do that at least once. I think week five or week six is a really great time for the students to be able to give you feedback about the class and how it's going. And even though it's in Blackboard, usually the survey responses are anonymous. This will give you a lot of really great information instead of having to wait until the summative course evaluation at the end. And you want to encourage students to contact you if there are any issues with your class. Sometimes we're just too close to things and we don't notice like the simplest errors, such as a module not being published when you thought it was published and have students, you can tell them in your syllabus, hey, don't, don't be afraid to give me some feedback if something's going wrong. So that is a boot camp overview of the online course design standards from Rush. If you have questions about these standards or um, you want help, like I said, reach out to ctei at rush.edu. We also have a request form that you can fill out, but I'm not going to give you that long web address at this time. So we're here to help and best of luck.